Now that we've explored the five kings by Gildas, we can now move on and discover kings who are not consistently condemned as sinners by the source material. Reen the Tall, son of Malguin Gweneth, King of Gweneth. During Reen's reign, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms began to expand and capture several important cities such as Salisbury in 552 AD clashing with the Britain kingdoms, as well as other Germanic kingdoms for territories. Migration to Brittany by the Britons was still continuing. For the reign of Rhine, his kingdom must still have been affected by the plague that took his father, the Plague of Justinian. John Davies, in his book The History of Wales, offers a theory on the effects of the plague on the Britons. The success of the English after 550 may have resulted in part for the instability of the Britons to resist them because they had been enfeebled by the plague. He then further suggests that the English avoided old Roman cities due to fear of the plague, which if this plague was as deadly as the Black Death of 1346 to 1353, then it most likely decimated the local population. Recent scientific studies of archaeological sites containing victims of the plague in Britain have shown the bacteria arrived in 544 AD. Reen's father, Malguin Gweneth, died in 547 AD from the plague. The plague not only infected the Britons, but also the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, as the site where the samples were taken from was at Edix Hill in Cambridgeshire. The effects of the plague could have contributed to more Anglo-Saxon control of Britain, or even the opposite, stemming the tide of migration into Britain. How Rhean managed his kingdom during the plague is unknown. We do know that Rhean was active with his army as he led a campaign up through the Pennines, a region of hills and mountains in the north of now England, towards Pickland. Using the Roman roads, for what reasons we can only guess marching that far given the era. Several later chronicles dated around the 13th century stated that Rhean marched with his army to displace his northern rivals and occupied the area for a time. Rhean's story ends with his death in an unknown battle or skirmish. Iago at Belli, grandson of Rhean, reigned from 599 to 1616 AD. We have hardly any information on his kingship. His death in the year 1616 was also when a major battle was fought at Chester, between the kingdoms of Powys and the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Bernicia. The battle's most famous aspect is the murder of the monks from the monastery of Bangor on Dee by the king of Bernicia, who was a pagan, and where Iago is connected to this is he might have been among the monks, as he may have joined the monastery at some point towards the end of his life or he may have even fought and died in the fighting, or his death in the same year could be a coincidence. Unfortunately, we don't have the full story. The Welsh triads give a different story of Iago being assassinated. Cadfan ap Iago, successor to Iago. We have no information on the reign of Cadfan, but reading his tombstone in Clangadwallader in Anglesey, it reads King Cadfan, most wise and renowned of all kings. Perhaps during his reign, the kingdom experienced peace and prosperity. Cadwallon. We have more details on Cadwallon than most early kings of Wales, as during his reign, Cadwallon had to deal with an ambitious king of Northumbria, Edwin, who invaded Wales, reaching as far as the Clyn Peninsula in North Wales, before turning his attention to Anglesey and trapping Cadwallon in a siege in the early 630s. He escaped to Ireland to recuperate before returning to his kingdom. Like a reinvigorated king from a long slumber, Cadwallon set about defeating his enemy and reclaiming his kingdom. He managed to secure an alliance not with another Welsh king, but King Penda of Mercia, a pagan Anglo-Saxon kingdom. This may have been the first time a Welsh king allied with an Anglo-Saxon king. Thanks to this alliance, Cadwallon drove Edwin out of Gwyneth winning some 14 battles, which later poems would tell us about. And thanks to the combined might of Gwyneth and Mercia, Edwin's own kingdom would be invaded. And at the climatic battle of Hatfield Chase, Edwin was slain. We have no details on the battle itself, 
No account for the numbers present, the tactics used, or formations. All we know is that Edwin was dead by the end of the battle. Further fighting continued in Northumbria as Cudwallan defeated and killed two of Edwin's successors, leaving Cudwallan as the ruler of Northumbria. No Welsh king had controlled this much of Britain since the Roman withdrawal. The main source for Cudwallan's story comes from Bede, and just like Gildas before him, Bede writes a scathing condemnation of a Briton king. Bede goes on to describe that Cudwallan set about to destroy the entire English race. Yet there is a contradiction here, as if Cudwallan sought to permanently remove the English from the Isle of Britain, then why would he have allied with the pagan king of Mercia? We could argue Cudwallan sacked the lands of Northumbria, as that is the nature of medieval warfare, and was a common practice at the time. After all, Cudwallan was on the defence at the start of the war against Edwin, so it makes sense to try and break a rival's kingdom in order to protect, or to even take the spoils of war and expand. Regardless of Cudwallan's long-term plans for Northumbria, they would never come to fruition, as Edwin's son Oswald defeated and killed Cudwallan at the Battle of Heavenfield. Cadwallan having a degree of fame was used in Geoffrey of Monmouth's tales, but as mentioned before, there was no historical context from Geoffrey, only pseudo-history. Before we continue to explore historical figures from Middle Ages Wales, it's important to explain the Celtic Church in Wales and how the Church changed over time, and the Age of Saints, which occurred from the 5th to the 6th century AD, in Wales, Ireland and Brittany. And like the historical figures from the era, there are mysteries, myths and legends. The earliest Christian object found in Wales is a vessel with the Christian symbol the Chiro on it dated around 375 AD, and found near the Roman town of Carwent. John Davis describes the early Celtic Church. The history of the Celtic Church has a great fascination, but so scarce is the contemporary evidence, and so abundant the stories invented in later centuries, usually with an ulterior motive, that it is difficult to distinguish between the true and the false. Perhaps the very term Celtic Church gives rise to confusion, for it was in fact an integral part of the Universal Church. The idea that it was proto-Protestant is a mistaken notion of reformers a thousand years later. Indeed, it would be better to describe it as the church among speakers of the Celtic languages. Christianity was experiencing a rapid amount of changes during the 5th to the 6th century, and many discussions were had about the true nature of Christianity and the worship of Christ. With the arrival of the Germanic peoples into Albion, they brought with them their own religion of paganism, which would see the Roman church sending missionaries to Britain in the 590s. But they would find the British church had its own practices of worshipping God, in the next episode, we will explore some of these British bishops and saints from Wales.